Welcome everyone to Office Hours. Please sing out on the chat line as soon as possible if you can't hear me. The microphone's placed nice right in front and center here, so hopefully it's coming through okay. And hopefully you can see me as well. Uh, if you've come on early to the call, I had a bit of fun there. I produced a little YouTube video uh, a couple of weeks ago about the life that all of us face, which is generally the concept of having to deal with uh, all the technical challenges that are presented to us, not in the workplace, but by our families. Uh, so yes, that was a bit.ly dot tech song guy, if you have some fun. Uh, I think it represents the pain and suffering we all go through. But enough, let's, let's not digress any further. Welcome to the November Office Hours for DBAs. Uh, this is getting up toward the 300th Office Hours in total. So it's been a, hopefully what you found very useful and a remarkable achievement. Hopefully we'll have one more DBA Office Hours uh, by the end of the year. Um, really depends on how my travel commitments go in December. As you're probably aware, it's definitely conference season at the moment. You've got DOAG and a few others all either going at the moment or coming up very soon. But let's share my screen and um, let's get into it. So hopefully you can all see that on your screens. Uh, getting in touch, as I say, is hopefully nice and easy. Uh, my Twitter link is Connor M underscore MC underscore D. To save bombarding you with a million links, I came up with a system where I found this website called Linktree. And if you go to Linktree slash Connor, uh, all it does is bring up a list of all the other links. So you can get me on Twitter, you can get my blog, you can get me on Instagram, Facebook, uh, SlideShare, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the other thing I do is I have a YouTube channel and all the Office Hours videos that I do uh, all get recorded and we put them up on the Oracle Developers YouTube channel in their entirety. Or if you're not particularly interested in sitting down for a one hour plus YouTube video, uh, you can get them in terms of packaged highlight versions, for lack of a better term, uh, on my own channel, which is uh, through there. As I always say at the start of every month, do not adjust your set. The slide content you see will generally be at the bottom left corner of the screen. Uh, that's because when we turn this into YouTube video, uh, that gives a bit of freedom up on the type right for you to see my charming face. Uh, I'm, many of you may want to choose not to have that, but that's how we have it. So a bit of bits and pieces before we get into the tech content. Number one, this is a personal thing. Up until now, all my internet usage, including office hour sessions, has been on six megabits per second. That's all we could get in Perth where I live. And just uh, two weeks ago, finally, some decent broadband speed came to my neighborhood. And so now we're on 90 megabits. Hopefully this makes office hours a little bit more smooth and fluid. Um, I know I've had people come to me and say, yeah, I came to your office hours session. It was like watching a pixelated version of The Simpsons. So hopefully the better internet speed will be better for you and me alike. I've just come back from a couple of tours, both regarding Application Express. The first one is Brisbane, and there's a picture there. I was there with Shakib Rahman and Christina Cho, two of the people who work in the Apex team. They were a huge success. And interestingly enough, the reason I wanted to bring it up is we had DBAs predominantly in there, not just Apex developers, but a lot of DBAs. I've done a YouTube video in the past. Uh, at some stage, I'll put a link um, out showing where I think the value is for DBAs in terms of Apex, especially the, the newer releases. But we had a number of DBAs there uh, in Brisbane. We had about 45 people in Brisbane. And in Sydney, we had about 30 people. And I really wanted to put there just as a shout out to say, if you want particular content, whether it's Apex, whether it's DBA topics, whether it's SQL topics, performance tuning, et cetera, be aware that we're very committed at Oracle, especially the team I'm in, the database advocates team, to not just do the, you know, content in terms of blog posts and stuff like that, but we'll also do them face to face if we can. So we have Chris in Europe, we have Dan and Blaine in the US, Stephen Feuerstein in the US, and I'm in the Oceania region. So if you want, please reach out to us. We'd love to visit you directly as customers and you know, help hopefully make you more successful with the Oracle database. That's our intention. That's the remit of our job. So anything we can do to help, please get in touch and we'll see if we can help out. For me coming up next week is the UK or next week after next is UK OEG down in Brighton. Hopefully if you're in Europe or in England uh, and you're coming along, please come along and say hello. I've got a couple of talks there. I'll be there for the whole week. And straight after that, literally flying out of UK OEG into the Sangam event, which is 
India's biggest user group Oracle event. Uh, we're looking at maybe a thousand people there. That's coming up literally the Friday and Saturday after UK OUG. So if you're in India on the call and you're somewhere near Hyderabad, please once again, drop in, say hello. Uh, if you're struggling in terms of um, in India, traveling to get to Hyderabad, uh, be aware that the reach out to Sai there, he told me that uh, people are welcome to reach out to him in terms of trying to get better accommodation deals. So that's enough in terms of what's coming up in the next couple of weeks, the busy conference season, and then we'll be into December, winding down for Christmas, but hopefully we'll be able to squeeze another office hours in. Tonight, now hopefully this uh, moving picture comes out well because you know, I wanted to put more video in my uh, slides tonight because we've got better broadband, or I've got better broadband. So tonight we're talking about catastrophes. We're talking about things that we do that I see in my, I'd rather not say, but maybe upwards of 30 years of IT experience, the things that I often see that uh, customers do wrong. Now, I'm not jumping up on my high horse here. I also include myself in that category. Um, I've been an Oracle customer even, and I consider myself still an Oracle customer, even though I work for Oracle, we use the technology and Sometimes you know, we encounter bugs, but sometimes we encounter problems of our own making. And I wanted to talk about some of the common ones today. That's the last of the white slides because as anyone's known, we have this new theme inside of Oracle. It's now called our Redwood theme. And um, I promised the design guys I would put this up. If you're interested in how we came up with a new theme, head over to design.oracle.com. Um, and there's lots of information there about the new theme. I quite like it. Uh, I think it's quite modern and not so much of a corporate look, which hopefully uh, we're trying to move away from. Now, before we start, I need to spend a moment, and, and the phrase we use in Australia is on the soapbox, um, and hopefully you're familiar with that, which is a little bit of a few minutes on, on pontificating about why I thought a talk in terms of mistakes uh, was important. And this is, you know, one of my sort of, you know, funny meme slides that I see from time to time on the internet when people make mistakes and, you know, the shipment of fail has arrived or hashtag fail you see on Twitter and all sorts of things is generally we're very reticent, very hesitant to talk about failure. And I think that's a bad thing because the reality is if you go to a conference and people talk about all the successes they've had. You know, we did this and it was fantastic. Or we use this facility, we use this feature and we use it brilliantly and, and we're pulling in this many transactions a second and this many new customers and this much revenue, etc. Generally, that kind of stuff helps the person doing the talking. They're talking about how they prospered. But the reality is, I think the opposite is true as well. If you talk about failure, then rather than it being just about oneself, it actually helps everyone because Failures are generally cautionary tales. And even as children, you know, our parents generally tell us cautionary tales about how to avoid getting into trouble. And that's why I think failure is actually a much better thing to talk about because generally it helps us as a community such that one person who inevitably was the, maybe the pioneer who had to encounter some sort of pain or, or suffering and, and failure, that lesson makes hundreds or thousands or millions of customers be able to avoid that pain by sharing that story. If we um, perhaps have too much vanity and we don't want to share stories of failure, then what happens, of course, is that you know, repeated people have those failures. And so that's what we're trying to avoid. And that's why I wanted to share them tonight. And I suppose the best way of describing this is I want to use tonight in terms of breaking the success hierarchy. And to help explain what I mean by the success hierarchy is we often see this kind of um, demographic inside the IT community. We have developers who are, you know, maybe up to report to DBAs or admins, then team leads, project managers, directors, etc. And failure is one of those terrible things where it's like a, the game of what we used to call Chinese whispers here in Australia, which is failure gets diluted as it works its way up the chain. So a developer might have some catastrophic problem. You know, I've shipped some code to production. And I've suddenly realized this is an absolute disaster. It's going to corrupt the data. The DBA, generally, DBA and developers work at the same level. They're going to be very, they're going to report up the chain saying, yep, oh my God, oh my goodness, the, the data is all corrupt. Now, the team lead doesn't want to report that up the chain because it makes him look bad or her look bad. So he'll go, oh, to his manager, you know, we've got some data corruption, but we've got some challenges, but we're, we're tackling it. 
And of course, the project manager, same thing, doesn't want to report, be reporting up the chain to say, we've got a cataclysmic issue here. So they'll say, we've got some issues with data quality. The director says, we're moving forward with some data challenges as he reports up the chain. And as the position you report to gets more and more senior, the risks associated with reporting failure get higher and higher. And so you start getting these, you know, we're maximizing opportunities in the data space. And at which point the CEO is reporting to the shareholder saying everything is just a-okay. And that's that dilution of failure because everyone's so scared about reporting failure. So my motivation tonight or today is to report more on failure so we don't get this kind of scenarios in your own customers where you're banging the drum saying we have a problem and that just continually gets diluted down and filtered away until bad things happen. I can give you a real life example. I worked for a place which shall remain nameless. I won't even talk about the field of work they were in. But many, many years ago, I worked at a place where a project literally ran off the rails. Um, and over the course of two years, when it finally made it up to the point where it was meant to go live, they realized that A, they were like years away from ever delivering and they were $2 billion in the hole, $2 billion in debt on this project by the time the CEO finally got an uh, honest report saying, yep, things have actually gone really bad. The warning signs were there for those two years, but no one was prepared to report their challenges up the line until it finally got to the CEO. He had to report to the shareholders saying, we're not ever going to deliver this project and we've burnt $2 billion. And he actually got forced to resign. That's the, the net end of not being able to report failure up the line. And I want to stress that Failure does not necessarily mean negligence, mostly. Most of us don't go to work thinking, I'm deliberately going to make a mess of my systems. We just unfortunately make mistakes. Really, it comes down to poor decision making. We make bad decisions and we get into some failure. And I thought it was particularly pertinent to talk about failure in the, in the uh, concept of decision making nowadays, because if you've been to any of the autonomous talks, that we've been spilling out over the past 18 months or so, we've been talking about your changing role as an IT professional. It's not necessarily just doing technical work anymore. That's still there, but you know, you hear about all this autonomous, autonomous, autonomous. What happens now is DBAs and developers are much more focused in decision-making now. They're the people being asked, what tech should we use? What gear should we use? What, what cloud should we use, et cetera? You're making big calls on the sake of your business and your business customers and obviously you'll be held responsible for them. So poor decision-making is particularly pertinent uh, today. The responsibility is now ours. Now I wanna stress, this is not a lynch mob mentality. I didn't wanna turn this into 55 minutes of just going, oh, and then there was this customer and they did this so stupidly, and then there was this customer, and they thought, what a mess they made. I didn't wanna be dancing on people's graves. We're not gonna do it. This is more about sharing information and hopefully providing remedies as well. And in particular, and I'll be dead set honest here, I've been guilty of this myself sometimes and asked someone in forums. It's important that those of us on the call, like myself, who perhaps have a lengthy experience in Oracle technology or any field of technology, it's very easy to be dismissive or hypercritical of people who make what we would now consider silly mistakes, but for them, they were just honest, genuine mistakes. This is a uh, website, a, a blog post I read a while ago, and I put a link there, nice and easy to remember, tinyurl.com be nicer. And it's a really humbling piece of work. And I suggest you read it if you're um, a long-term Oracle practitioner. It's a great way of talking about the fact that how we actually should um, be humble and warm and, and comforting to those people who make mistakes who have less experience than ourselves. Anyway, let's get started into it. I don't want to pontificate for too long. We have time is running short. Mistake number one I'm going to talk about is consistency. Now, that obviously will require um, a little bit of explanation. Let's talk about what I mean by consistency as a mistake. I'm not talking about acid versus base here. And if you're unfamiliar with those terms, acid is a property of relational databases. Uh, the concept of things like atomic transactions, durability, integrity, the kind of things we know and love in terms of relational database versus base, which stands for basically available, soft state, and eventually consistent. Uh, the thing where if you log onto Twitter from two different terminals, you might see different things at the same time. So we're not talking about the acid versus base properties of databases, and hence we're not talking about NoSQL versus relational. It's not that kind of consistency. 
This is the kind of consistency which I refer to as a mistake. I run the following query, select distinct percent free IOT type and compression from DBA tables. And it always astounds me. It doesn't really matter what data, what customer I go to. I run this query and I always get one row back. And that row is this, percent free 10, IOT type null, compress disabled. Now, why is this a big deal? Why do I view this as a mistake? What this query is telling us that across the entire database for this customer, and I'm a bit being a bit facetious here, the internal dictionary has some discrepant some difference to this, but for customer tables, what we see is every table is created with percent free 10 because that's the default. Every table is created as a heap table, which is IoT type null, because that's the default. And every table has no compression because compression disabled is the default. We've come to this place now in the Oracle database, which I find is a mistake, which is everyone just uses the defaults. Don't get me wrong, as a DBA, when it comes to creating a database, generally things like the parameters and the storage options, et cetera, using the defaults is a good thing. You get better support if you can go back to Oracle support and say, here's my database, it's very much defined like the default operations. But this is lower level, this is down in terms of your table levels. We used to tackle this as part of physical design. And we sort of throw back many years ago where as database administrators or developers as well, we actually went through that, what, what people now say critically as waterfall, but that process of do a logical data model, come up with a logical data model, generate some ER diagrams, some entities. And then there was this separate phase where we actually did physical design. How can we best lay out the tables on the database for the needs of the business but of course, that pretty much has gone nowadays. Nowadays, in the era of DevOps, what's happening is DDL to create objects is coming flying across the, the, the fence, either from developers or others, flying across the fence as fast as possible. And it's probably not even touching the DBA. It's going into some automated process where that DDL is being applied straight into the database. And so we never even get to see it. And thus, physical design has almost become a thing of the past. My verdict here is there is still no excuse for us as DBAs to not do physical design, even if we're not seeing the DDL, even if it's being wrapped up in some sort of automation process, such as liquid base Ansible, et cetera. All that means is nowadays in the world of DevOps is we should be doing our physical design later. And what I mean by later is after the fact, after the tables have gone in, there's nothing to stop us from doing that and capturing that benefit later. So let's tackle those three things one at a time. Let's talk about percent free 10 first. The reason I think percent free 10 is generally a mistake is when I look at most computer projects, now I've drawn a little graph here showing a project. We have the various phases of the project. So at the top is phase one, which starts at the earliest point in time, then phase two and phase three up to phase N. And there's always a project in, there's always a phase in the documents for that project called the archival phase. This is where we will remove old data and keep our database a steady state, et cetera. And yes, that phase is generally in the document uh, or the yellow sticky that's stuck up on the wall as part of a scrum or a sprint. But tell you what, it's the one phase that never ever gets done. You know, we used to call it just, we've run out of budget. Now we call it something more fancy. We call it technical debt. But either way, archiving is one of those things that just never gets done. In fact, if I change the graph slightly, my view is always, if the current phase of a project is phase N, where phase N is indicated by that dotted line, the archive stage is always N plus one. And it doesn't matter as the project moves along, the archive phase moves along to be just always out of reach. And in particular, databases are actually changing for genuine reasons as well, not just because we haven't got the budget or the inclination to do archiving. Databases are changing, and you've probably seen this slide ram down your throat many, many times over the past few years about big data, you know, volume, velocity, variety, that, you know, if one more person, you know, tells me about the four Vs again, I'm going to absolutely lose my mind. But as a result, we're storing more and more data and we're never, ever getting rid of it. What does that mean? It means database core fundamentals, the four things you do as DML, select, insert, update, and delete, aren't really applicable anymore. We're never deleting and we're very rarely updating. We're simply taking vast amounts of data, slamming it into the database and then querying it. Under that new model, that more modern model of database, 
percent free 10 is a bad idea because percent free 10 is all about updating data in place. Even if we're still deleting data, even if we're deleting old data, we actually managed to have one of those lucky projects where we did actually get into the archive phase of our project. Even then, percent free is not really applicable to systems that just do inserts and deletes. All that percent free is applicable for is if you're updating data in place. For that reason, my view is the default, you're probably default for percent free should be percent free equals one. Because why reserve 10% of your entire database for free space that will never be filled? Because it's only gonna be filled if you update rows and moreover, it's only gonna be filled if you update rows that make them larger. So percent free equals 10, I think is the product of a bygone era. Systems were different in those days. We should be looking at percent free one as being our default. You might wanna look at manipulating any trans if you're using percent free one, just in case you expect future updates because percent free one may limit the amount of space for ITL entries but it's very rare that you'll need to do that. But I think percent free one is a logical default for most of our databases nowadays. Let's move on to compression now. Now, before you get upset with me, I'm not talking about the advanced compression facility, which is obviously a separately charged option, unless you're using some of our cloud facilities. So I'm talking about the basic level of compression here. And it's amazing how few people use it on their systems. Sometimes people use it on their data warehouses, but very few use it on their transactional systems. But this is one of my favorite sort of quotes. I, I apologize to whoever the author is. I couldn't find the name of the author. It's certainly not my quote, but I love it. And that's data ages like wine and applications age like fish. And it's true. Generally older data isn't data that becomes obsolete. Obviously older data sometimes increases in value like a fine wine and typically in bulk. Modern data, we're looking for one particular transaction. What are the transactions for this customer? As data gets older, we're looking for things like, what are the yearly sales? What's the 10 year sales? How can we use that to build forecasts? So older data is often accessed in bulk and that's where its real value comes in. And here's the key point. Compressing that older data is a free operation. It doesn't cost you any license fee in the Oracle database to use basic compression. It's available straight out of the box on Enterprise Edition. And the key thing is basic compression is also something that can be done online in modern versions of the Oracle database. That opens up huge opportunities in terms of your transactional systems. I can have my existing data just being inserted in the normal way, it won't be compressed. But for no license fee, I can take my older data and compress it while my systems are actually running. And I thought I'd show you a little bit of a demo of that. So let's do a new share. So hopefully we can all see that and the font is large enough. So I'm gonna create a table called T here. And it's 50 copies of DBA objects. DBA objects is typically about 80,000 rows. So you can see there, I've got about 4 million rows in my table. That's my indicative measure of a transactional table. Now, to do some transactions, you can see the table is about 80,000 blocks in size. Now, to do some transactions, to simulate some tractions while I'm going to do the compress, I'm going to create a procedure call called insert. It's not particularly um, spectacular. What I'm doing is 60 iterations of inserting a single row, and each row will have a negative object ID. It makes it nice and easy to find it in the table because currently the table only has positive object IDs. And I'm going to sleep for one second. So because it's 60, an iteration of 60, that job's gonna run for one minute. And every second it's gonna insert some rows. Now, rather than firing up another window, which will make my Zoom extremely complicated, I'm gonna submit that as a job. So I'm gonna submit it as a job. And with Windows, jobs may sometimes take a little while to start running. So to prove I'm not fooling you, I'm gonna do this little routine here to make sure that the job is actually running. It's finished now, which says, yes, that job is definitely running. So while I'm inserting rows now, one every second, I'm gonna actually move my table, my transactional table and compress it and do it online. So it won't take too long, the table's not too large, only four million rows. But while it's busily compressing, be aware that we've got a job in the background running and inserting rows. To prove that to you, I can actually query my table called T, where all the new rows, their object IDs that were negative to see, and you can see 
they've been regularly coming in. It took about 30 seconds. It's been running for 30 seconds. If we look at the actual data, you can see it's 15, 16, 17, 18, starting from the top. We are still quite happily inserting one row a second. They didn't get blocked. They didn't get held up, etc. We can do compression online while transactions are occurring in our databases. If I go look at the size of the table after I've compressed it, you might see something that looks a bit alarming. It looks like, oh my goodness, the table is still 80,000 blocks. The only reason that is there is that's a figure that's calculated by Optimizer Statistics. If I actually regather the stats, chug, 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 we'll see that it's actually not 80,000 blocks anymore. The table is actually about one quarter the size. So there I have a system which has online transactions still coming in. They're not being impacted. I can compress the data, which goes and tabs all the existing data, which in a real situation is obviously your older data, and I can compress it while transactions come in. Now, when I'm doing queries on this table for older data, like show me all of last year's results, all of last 10 years' results, then of course, that's going to be approximately four times faster on full table scans because this is now much, much smaller. Don't get me wrong, new transactions are coming in and they are not compressed but I can do this compression activity once a week, once a month, et cetera, at appropriate times. Don't get me wrong, if I'm absolutely slamming this thing with transactions, that would not be a good time to do a compression. What we're looking for is a quiet time where the number of transaction volume is as low as we can manage, and then the compression won't be impacted and won't be as impactful on transactions. But you can see there, it's not actually stopping them from recurring. The compression runs while transactions are quite happily being created and committed. There's no blocking locks going on there. So it's pretty cool. So that's compression. I've, had, I've covered percent free and we've covered compression. So we've covered compression. Let's now talk about the last one, IoT type. And IoT type is what kind of tables do you have in your system besides heap tables? And the key thing here is really understanding customer needs. And I'll show you a demo now that I've done um, at Oracle Code a number of times since the, uh, the OC prefix in the script name there. But I've added some to it so I can actually see what's going on behind the scenes. I do this script at Oracle Code uh, as a way of sort of a pseudo magic trick, but we'll do it uh, much more openly here. So let's do another share. So this is the magic demo we do at Oracle Code events. We have a table called My Transactions One. It's uh, effectively a simulation of customer transactions. There's no rows in the table, and we're gonna put 200,000 rows into it using this table called tab 200K. I'm gonna do this query now on customer 160. The first query, the key figure here is consistent gets. We can see 533 consistent gets. That's because we had to pass the query. If we do it the second time now that we pass it, it's 402 consistent gets, and that's repeatable. We can see it is 402. That's what it costs to get customer 160 details from that table. Now I'll look at my transactions number two. It's got the identical column structure. It's empty just like my transactions one and I'll copy all the rows from my transactions one to my transactions two. So they are identical in terms of data. I count the rows, there's 200,000 in each table. I look at the row, the differences in data. Transactions one minus transactions two. Transactions two minus transactions one. There's no difference in data. They even had the same indexing structure. So this is what we do at the Oracle Code events. We say, look at these, these tables are intrinsically identical. To refresh your memory, if I look at my transactions one for customer ID 160, it's still 402 consistent gets. That's what it costs. Let's run the exact same query against my transactions two for the exact same customer. Bear in mind it's the exact same data and it's 131 consistent gets. So that's almost four times faster. And don't forget, that's the first query. Now that I've passed it, now it's 39 consistent gets. Now it's 10 times faster. And that's where we leave the demo at Oracle Co. We say, look at this, isn't it amazing? Yeah, you know, it's some magic trickery here. Let's actually move through to actually what I want to display here, which is about the IoT type. Most of us probably will have guessed that the difference here is the way we've structured the table. My transactions one, if we look at the DDL, is just a stock standard heap table, like so many people do for every single table in their database. And for a lot of tables, that's fine. 
If we look here, you can see the word using index, but that's purely for the constraint, my transaction PK. It's the constraint definition here that is actually the index. Let's now look at my transactions number two. It's doing some DDL, DBMS metadata DDL as well. Let's see what we get for my transactions number two. And here's where we can see the difference. It is an in organization index table. Let me try that again in English. It is an organization index table. The data is stored as an index, not as a heap table. And that's why we got those massive benefits because all the rows for each customer are clustered together in an index structure, therefore less IO. This is the magic we don't show people um, at Oracle Code. But here's a classic example of where if my business requirements are all about getting information for customers quickly, then an IOT on customer ID and the primary key would be an obvious choice. There will be an expense to inserting rows into that table, but if the governing business functions, the thing that really matters to your business are, how can I get customer details back to the customer on their web browser or their mobile device fast, then an IoT might be the perfect fit. It is about understanding business requirements that is critical. Let's bring this back to physical design. I said with the DevOps world, sometimes it's too late. That table may be already be in production now as a heap table and to convert it to an IOT is not something that can be done online easily. There's no alter command that can do it. You can use DBMS redefinition, but it can't be done easily in current versions of Oracle. There are other options available to you. You could look at attribute clustering, which doesn't change a table from being a heap but still gets those benefits. Let's have a little look at this demo. What do I call it? Plust. So I'm taking my transactions one. This is the table that's just a plain heap table. And I'm adding this attribute called clustering by linear order. That is simply a dictionary definition. It doesn't actually do anything to the data yet. If I actually look at my query, you can see I'm still at 400 plus consistent gets for customer 160. But what I can do online without interrupting service, as we saw, is I can actually move that table online. That will reload the data and now take into account that dictionary information saying I would like the data clustered by customer ID. I regather some stats and now when I look at customer 160 for my transaction one, which is a heap table and used to be 400 consistent gets, now down to 60. I'm not as good as the IoT, but I'm very, very close. I'm you know, still looking at what six, seven fold performance in benefit there by using linear clustering. So these are some of the options available to us when it comes to physical design after the fact. I can't convert to an IoT, but I can look at things like linear clustering or even randomized clustering to actually get performance benefits based on business requirements. And I keep stressing, it is based on those business requirements. If your system says, I need to get data by transaction ID, then you might look at a different structure. But in this example, we're looking at customer ID. That's the key. That's mistake number one. Holy moly, the time flies. Mistake number two. Let's jump ship a bit here. A mistake number two is having clean backups. Once again, that seems like a very odd statement to make. Let me elucidate on that. This is something I've seen at many sites over the years. Thankfully, it seems to be dissipating, but I saw one recently and that's why I thought I'd share it with you. This is such a really common backup strategy, especially in sites where they are perhaps a bit strapped for disk space. And in the world of budgets, et cetera, that often becomes the case. On Monday, make some space available, start your backup, do your backup and finish your backup. On Tuesday, make some space available, start your backup and finish your backup. It seems a fairly sound strategy. But the problem, of course, is this. The moment you clear your backup and start another backup, during that time frame, you actually have no backup anymore. And that's a big drama because if you were to have some sort of problem during that time frame, you actually are left high and dry. And this is one of the key things that it's amazing how often I see this still, whether people are using RMAN or not, or even old style backup scripts. That concept of clearing out some space to make available for the next backup is fine as long as you have lots of backups, not just one, because you will literally one day, as sure as night follows day, you're gonna end up with no backup at all and then you're in dire straits. 
And of course, people say to me, yeah, we would never do that. <laughs> We're not stupid. But you might be able to do it. You might be doing it in what I call uh, an unknown or unintentional way. This is perhaps a more common reason nowadays that we see people, what I call, not actually having a backup when they think they might actually have one. It's not as obvious, not as standout as actually wiping out some files and then re overusing that space. That seems to stand out like, yeah, I would never do that. But I'm amazed at how many people have this in their backup scripts. They want to make sure that the backup is clean. As I said, clean backups I'm claiming are a mistake. So the first thing they'll do is they don't want to get any errors. So they do a cross-check, you know, cross-check backup, cross-check copy, cross-check archive log to make sure that the RMAN catalog is all in sync with the real world out there because that, you know, that's what we want. The catalog and the control files in sync with the real world out on disk. And then for those things that are now expired, that are no longer found, we do delete no prompt expired and they're gone. And then our backup, of course, will report no errors. That's a really bad idea. Crosscheck was never designed for regular use inside your backup regime. Crosscheck is designed for emergency or out of the ordinary purposes. Oh, what did I do then? Did I zoom in? Let's go back. Let's look at why this is a bad idea. Let's say I've got a whole stack of archive logs here. I've got some archives starting at 2670, 2671, 2672, etc. These are all the archives I need to back up. These are the ones that are not yet backed up. Now, for some reason, unbeknown to me, it could have been an errant script. It could have been you know, a bad disk, whatever. Let's say we've lost one of those backups. RMAN is great. It's hooked into the Oracle database. It knows what archives are meant to be there. It knows what archives are meant to be backed up. So out of the box, if you just say, I want to back up my archives and one's missing, RMAN is going to absolutely lose its mind. It's going to give you errors and all sorts of things. It's just going to be really, really upset with you. This is a red flag. You're missing an archive. This is a big deal. However, if you're running this as part of your backup script, your regular backup script, let's do a cross check. Let's do a delete, no prompt. Well, when that archive is missing, when you do a cross check, it's going to actually mark that archive as, yep, I expected the archive to be there. It's no longer there. It's therefore expired. You'll now do your delete. The RMAN catalog is, yes, now perfectly in sync with reality. But reality is a problem. Reality is where you're missing an archive log. So what's going to happen is RMAN is going to say, yeah, we're cool. Life's great. I've backed up everything I need to back up. Every backup you do is going to say, yep, everything is fine. There are no problems to report. And of course, that's well and good until you try to restore or do a recovery because you'll happily recover, restore from a database backup set or backup uh, image. And of course, you'll start rolling forward. You'll get to archive 2671. And that's when your world will come crumbling down. Because at no point in time did our man say to you, you know, there's a big drama here because we're missing an archive log. So that's a more common example nowadays I see of people effectively using clean backups, but actually creating mistakes for themselves. Please don't use crosscheck as part of your regular scripts in Amen. Here's my mantra when it comes to backups. For data files, I don't like the term redundancy. And I know that inside your standard operations in times of Amen, you can say, I want to configure my backup retention for either redundancy or recovery window. For me, I prefer recovery window because if I have a corrupted data file and I back it up, it doesn't matter if I back it up three times or 10 times, it's still a corrupted data file. So I always think about, I want to make sure my recovery window is satisfied, whether that's seven days or two days, whatever. And that way I can do regular tests. I don't like the term redundancy uh, when it comes to backing up my data files. Conversely, when it comes to archives, I actually don't prefer recovery window. I prefer redundancy. And the reason for that is, is if, you're lost, if you lost an archive file, there is no way back. You know, you've literally lost a chunk of redo that is required to roll your database forward. So for me, if I've got one copy of my archives, I'm not happy. If I've got two, I may be happy. If I've got three, I'm happier. And if I happen to have 15 copies of my archives because I've got oodles of this space, hey, I'm good with that as well. I'm never going to say, you know, I've just got too many copies of my archives. That for me is just a non-existent sentence. 
I'm always going to keep, as long as I've got plenty of disk space, as many archives as possible, both literally in my archive destination, but in my backups as well. For me, archives are so sacred. You know, I can always, if I've got a bad backup, go back to the previous backup. If I've got a bad archive, I'm, I'm toast. I can't stress enough keeping those, back, those archives as long as possible um, within your constraints. I'm not saying that's a rule. I'm saying that's my mantra. That's how I build my backup scripts always. Recovery window for the database files and redundancy for the archives as that just in case, that extra insurance policy. And as DBAs, we're meant to be paranoid and cautious. And the final thing I'll say on clean backups is percent %u, that random string that Oracle likes to put in its backup set names or image copy names, et cetera. It looks ugly and often people steer away from it. It's your friend, especially in the world where people are moving from non-pluggable databases, 11, 2, and 12, to pluggable databases, because as we know in 20C, that's all you get. I've started to see people's scripts fail silently with things like this. They started off obviously with only ever one system table space, in under, and, but under a pluggable regime, that's different. You have multiple system table spaces, and out of the box, they're typically all called the same name, the same final file name, system01.dbf. So I've often seen people have their scripts where they're literally copying data files, just the file name, whether they're using RMAN or whether they're using homegrown scripts to a target destination. Because in the old days, by definition, every single file was a unique name. You could quite happily copy it over. Sometimes now in pluggable databases, obviously you're gonna have multiple copies of the same file name out of the box. So if you copy system01 three times to the same target folder, then generally you're gonna have some dramas. Our man's normally gonna kick up a fuss, but if you're using homegrown scripts, that's gonna once more come out and bite you. So yeah, so percent new, just get used to the fact that lots of cryptic names, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Let's move on to mistake number three. It is a mistake to restore your database. Once again, hopefully that is somewhat of a uh, inflammatory remark to talk about why restoring your database is perhaps a mistake. To help set the scene for that, I'm gonna drink a water first. To help set the scene for why restoring your database is perhaps a bad idea, let's talk about the evolution of backup and restore. In the good old days, databases were small. They were tiny little things. And so you had a database and you had plenty of space in which to back it up. So you'd simply take a full copy of the database. And the next night, take another full copy of the database. If it only takes 15 minutes to back up, why not copy the whole thing? Grab another one, et cetera, et cetera. It was very easy to do backups. Before our man or even with our man, you simply, simply grab the whole database, slammed it onto a backup target, and you're good to go. If you ever need to restore it, you just copy it back because the copying to and from was relatively quickly. And of course, what happened? Databases got big, that's what happened. And all of a sudden, they took a long time to back up. But more importantly, you could now fit maybe one onto your backup storage, but the moment you said, look, I need to copy two or three, then that's a bit of a problem because no one gave you the budget to have those backups stored. And so we had some dramas there. And what did we invent? Well, we started looking at incremental backups. And so, yes, we still have one big copy of the database and we started heading into incremental land to actually take Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday as incrementals from say Sunday's backup. I would imagine that this is probably the most common thing you see, even on our cloud databases, incrementals generally are the way we move forward. It's a very common strategy because we don't have the space for lots and lots of copies of our database. Hopefully, if you've attended some of my office hours sessions and before, you're now using blockchain tracking, which simply doesn't change the paradigm, but it makes backing up those incrementals blazingly fast. And obviously, therefore, the time it takes to back up that one huge database becomes a very rare event and your incrementals can just fly forward very, very quickly because of blockchain tracking. The problem is no one cares. No one cares if your backups are fast. And when I say no one, I mean your business users, your business customers. You might care because it's less load on your server, it's less fretful and downtime for you, but the reality is no one cares about backup speed. 
where you're paid, it's where your money is really earned as a DBA is when it comes to restoration. And the problem is it doesn't matter how fast your backups are. When it comes to restoring, when you lose that primary database and your job is now to restore it, well, that's a big deal because first of all, you've got to pull that huge database back in place and now you're paying the price for the benefit of backup speed. All those incrementals now have to be applied as well. You might be using differential incrementals, which avoids some of this, but still it's take a full copy of a database from some time ago and roll incrementals onto it until it comes back up to date. That's restoring, and I view restoring as a mistake because it takes forever. And every minute you're down during a restoration is where your reputation is being torn away at. No one cares that your backups are fast. What if we could have a database ready? Rather than doing backup and recovery, we could have a, have a database ready to go. Now, don't panic. I'm not talking about Active Data Guard. I'm not talking about Rack. I'm not talking about anything which is going to cost you money. Everyone always freaks out when I say have a database ready. It's got nothing to do with having you give more money to Oracle. This is not going to cost you anything more. Rather than doing backups of your database, let's do some copies of our database. And really, it's just some very small changes to our scripts. Let's do a demo. Now, I wrote this demo about 20 minutes before we came online, so hopefully it works. I had to go create a few databases to do it. So I'm starting with, this is my backup location, X Oracle Backup DB19. This is a version 19 database, but this will work all the way down to Oracle 10. Nothing especially new here. My backup destination is currently empty. So this is what I'm going to do. And the script looks a bit odd. I'm going to first thing is recover my database. Now that's weird. If I'm doing a backup, why would I need to recover? That will become apparent shortly. But then I'm gonna do this. I'm going to backup at incremental level one, my database. Because I have no backups, we just saw the backup folder was empty. That's gonna do a full copy of the database first time. So let's give it a run. Oh, maybe, oh, maybe my database is not up and running. Let's try that again. It is not up running. The other unfortunate thing, of course, is I got Zoom running and we're recording this, which obviously chews away at the CPU. But here we go, my database is up and running. It's mounted. Come on, it's nearly open. I'm looking at the time as well. Okay, so let's see if my backup demo runs again. From the top, as you can see, my backup directory is empty. We have no backup so far. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a recovery of the database. And that seems weird because I'm meant to be doing a backup, but that will become apparent shortly. Now I'm doing a backup at level one. Now, because we have no backups, the first one will be a full copy of the database. Let's see if this works. That looks a bit better. So as I said, the first thing is we're doing a recovery first, which does nothing. It says I have nothing to do to recover on. So we'll come back to that. I have no parent backup copy, which means I have no level zero to work for. And so this first copy, even though it's level one, is a full copy of the database. It's a very small database. That's why I created it before uh, this demo started, such that we could back it up quite quickly. You can see that now we have some files in our backup destination, and it's just a very empty database. We've got sysorg, system, undo table space, users, etc. Just the four data files in a default database. This one's non-pluggable to keep it nice and small. If I look at this, you can see the size of the files are pretty much comparable to the size of the database. I've got 500 megs for sysorc and 480 megs rounded down, down here in the database. So it's reasonable to assume that that is literally a copy of the data files. They are literally copies as opposed to backup sets. Let's go into RMAN again and run that same backup. This is the next day's backup. Once again, it does this thing. It tries to do a recovery and finds nothing to recover which is correct, I'll come back to that in a second. Now I'm doing an incremental and it's very, very fast because I have a full copy of the database to work with and this is now just the changes. Once that finish is done, now I can see my backup folder. I've got the original full copy of the files and I've got my incremental, which is only 130 kilobytes because I've changed very, very little. So I have a full copy and one incremental. 
Now let's run my backup script on the third day. Now here's where things get interesting. My recovery is actually doing some work now. If I scroll back up, you can actually see the recovery phase is actually doing some work. What it's doing is, is taking that incremental I just took and it's rolling that incremental into the full copies of the files. That full copy of the database is now being rolled forward. And then it goes ahead and takes another incremental. So now you can see I've got my full copy of the data files. I've got my two incrementals and this incremental has now actually been pushed into the full copy of the database. So the full copy of the database has actually been moved forward slightly as well. Let's actually do a little bit of work now to actually prove that this is working. I'll drop a couple of tables. I'll put some new tables in place. So I'm actually doing some work. I'm creating some objects in the database and I can look at my SCN number on this database. It's 1957479. Now I go back and do my nightly backup. There's my users table space. It's currently at 8.52 PM in Perth time. And just to prove that things are actually happening here, I run my standard incremental backup. It rolls forward an incremental and then it does another incremental. Now when I look at my users thing, it has moved from 8.52 to 8.53. So the file name of the full copy of the users database has moved forward. If I go look at recovery manager, I can actually see I've got some information there, but notice the checkpoint SCN is still lower than the one I actually queried. The other one was, oh, I think it's probably gone, has it? Yeah, I scrolled it off. I think it was 1957 something. So my users table space is still old because I've rolled forward last night's incremental, not the one I've taken after I've created that table. So it'll actually be tomorrow night, the next incremental, that's actually going to roll those changes through into my users table space. So if I go into recovery manager and list out the SCN, now it's moved on to 1957. So it's picked up those two tables, T1 and T2. So what have I achieved here? Let me do that pictorially. This is what I've achieved. I took a backup and I took an incremental. I then took another incremental, but in part of doing that, I rolled the main backup forward. So that, that, that um, backup now is now quite close to current point in time. When I took the next incremental, I used the previous one to roll that backup forward as well. So my full backup is not one from last Sunday anymore. It's always one that I can just go back, maybe just one worth of incremental. I'm shrinking that backup restore time down dramatically because I only ever have to apply one incremental. At which point you're saying, it doesn't really matter how many incrementals I have to apply. It's the cost of removing that whole backup and putting that back into place, that huge database. That comes back to this slide. If we can free ourselves from the concept of our file names have to be these pretty file names in pretty locations, that we just don't care where the database is, any file name in any location is a valid database, then backup databases, which are copies of the database, become very, very powerful. As I said, I've got this full copy of the database, which I've been rolling forward. Now I've had a catastrophe on my main database. What do I do? How do I restore that database? Because the very start of this topic, I said, restoring is a mistake. Well, let's see what we do. I need to kill off my database. I'm simulating here that my main database has been fried. I'm just going to shut down a board, but let's say it's blown up, it's lost some data files, etc. I'm just going to kill it off, shut down a board. So how do I restore it? What do I have to copy around? Well, here's the key. I don't have to copy anything around. I'm going to start up my database in mount stage because I'm trying to recover it. It's going to take a while because this is a little old slow PC, but it's doing its best. Come on. Okay, finally it started up. So there's our database started. As I said, it's been corrupted. We've lost our data files. Do I have to do a restore? No, because I have, let me scroll back a bit. Because I have this backup, which is literally a copy of the database. And it's a copy of the database that I have been rolling forward in time. There's no restore to be done. I simply say, switch my database to become that copy. The database is now the files that were on my backup location. It's now a fully fledged database. 
I can recover it, which simply says take the latest incremental and push it forward and open the database up. I'm done. There was no restore done being done. There's no file copying going around. And in fact, if I now log on to my database, it's open and you can see the database files are actually now the backup files. Now, I now take a backup. Where would I put this backup if I'm putting it here? Well, I would simply put it back in the original location. I would simply flip flop over, assuming those disks are still valid for use. And so that's the benefit here. If I start using backup as copy and that rolling recovery mechanism, I actually don't need to ever do a massive restoration. Restoration can be considered a mistake. We just want to do database switches and database recoveries. It's blazingly fast. The other benefit of that is if you have sufficient disk space, then I can have one database which is only one incremental behind. I could have another database full copy somewhere, which is perhaps five days behind if I ever need to go back further than that. I could have one which was 10 or 15 or 20 days behind. So if I ever got to the point where I need to recover quickly to yesterday, I've got my standard backup. If I need to recover quickly to a week ago, I've got another backup which I can go back to that one. Once again, just switch to copy. If I've got one which is a month old, I can switch to that one as well. So I can have a few copies kept at various points in time. All I change in my script is I say recover up until sysdate minus 14, recover until sysdate minus 30, etc. That's the only change in that script I have to do. The RMAN infrastructure will take care of rolling that forward just enough to keep it as old as I require it. That's pretty cool. We're going to do this next month as well because I didn't even get halfway through the list of mistakes I wanted to cover. But what I'm emphasizing is the importance of failure and the importance of us being able to share our failures with others. Most of these things you've seen this in the slides today and the demos today are things that I've done or I've learned the hard way um, in my Oracle career. My favorite example of this is I went to a talk many, many years ago given by an Amazon DBA. And they spoke about the fact that they inadvertently set the max extents unlimited facility on the bootstrap dollar segment, which is the very first segment the database reads when you actually start the database. Next time they bounced their database, which was three months later, long after this had been long forgotten, the database wouldn't start. And this is one of Amazon's most famous outages way back in the day, where literally they were down for two days. And obviously the media were all over them because they had to get actually some internal help from Oracle Sport to come in and actually hack their database dictionary to actually fix this. They actually had to do some binary editing of files because they'd inadvertently set max extents unlimited to a special internal table. How do we know about this? The Amazon DBA gave a talk about it. That's what I like, the concept of sharing failure. That was a lesson that said to every single person on the planet who runs a database, don't ever do this. It's absolutely terrible. Anyway, the hour is up. Thank you very much for your attendance. It's always a pleasure to have you online. I uh, hope you found something useful today. And yes, there'll be more mistakes next month because we have much more to cover. So I'll try to squeeze that into December, but if not, it'll be in the new year. As always, thanks very much. Please reach out to me on Twitter if you have any thoughts or comments. And hopefully we'll see you all again soon. Thank you, everyone. And enjoy the rest of your evening, morning, day, etc. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the day.